Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 334. Uh, we have Marty Malloy on the show. She's a judo athlete, a jiu-jitsu athlete. Uh, we've got a link to her bio and some stuff in the show notes, so make sure you check that out as well. Let's start off with a quote, and this is by Benjamin Franklin. It says, be at war with your vices, at peace with your neighbors, and let every new year find you a better man. So, uh, yeah, Ben Franklin was a pretty smart guy, and I would definitely agree that being at peace with your neighbors is better than being at war with them, and we've all got vices we fight, but uh, we're coming up on New Year's, or by the time this airs, I guess we're past New Year's, but if you're going to make any New Year's resolution, it's kind of vague, but I suppose just being a little bit better version of myself than I was last year is a pretty good New Year's resolution. What do you think, Gary? You know, Joe, I don't think you could be a better version of yourself because, uh, you know, like I've always thought, you're you're the perfect human. God dang it. You just (laughs) – what do you think, Byron? I think Gary needs uh, (laughs) needs to come back to reality here. We we all have things we can work on. I do like the idea, um, you know, a bit extreme, but be at war with your vices. Find find things that are – um, kind of holding you back or, or you know, com- preventing you from reaching your best and, and try to take those out, you know, try to find ways to, to get rid of those from your life um, and then be at peace with your neighbors. And that, that's a good one, you know, be at peace with the people around you, um, get along with people is an important, it's a, really a skill that uh, a lot of people lack. So being able to, to be friendly towards people that you may have really nothing in common with or whatever, you know, your neighbors, be at peace with those people, uh, be at peace with everybody in your life. You know, you just get along if at all possible. Not everybody is, is reasonable, but <laughs> we all can't be like Gary, but yeah, that's, that's a good, no. that's a good uh, direction to get you headed into. And then of course, you know, throw your own, own stuff on there as well. But yeah, if you could just find one or two, weaknesses in your life or vices that you have that that's kind of holding you back from one thing if you can get rid of those uh i think you're going to set yourself free in this new year byron it's really interesting you should bring that into play here because i heard something about walt disney last week and i tried to find a quote because i wanted to bring this concept to the show and you just opened the door for it apparently walt disney had this philosophy from the time he opened disney world each year he would review all of the attractions and the poorest perform, poorest performing attraction would get cut. It's like whatever's doing the worst, we can definitely come up with something better than that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's a great idea to just kind of review the, your year at the end. And, you know, what, what's one thing that I can change? What's the one thing holding me back? Uh, something getting my way from training or whatever. I just I kind of like that idea about the worst performing aspect gets cut. Interesting. And that, what was that? Uh, oh, the GE guy. Um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. The the CEO of Welsh. GE Forever. He would they, Jack Welsh. He they would cut the bottom ten percent of their employees every year. Like, oh Ooh, man, that's, that's intense. <laughs> yeah, similar idea, but then you're talking about amusement park <laughs> ride. But but he found like I forgot what his book was called, but he found people literally like, okay, you know, Joe, you're in charge of you know developing razor blades, and, and your division needs to cut ten percent. You got to give him a number with like X amount of names on it, and and some of those names are people. It turns out have died, <laughs> people that quit on their <laughs> own, like. People are doing everything they could after the first year or two of cuts because it's sometimes it's easy to look around. Okay, he could go, he could go. He's not he's not helping us at all. After a while, that ten percent is pretty quality of uh, of employee, and you don't want to see anybody go. And uh, it, that that reminds me of that same but, idea. Yeah, but I mean, we get to that point, and like you said, you're you've got a lot of good employees. They may yeah. just be in bad, you know, bad fits. Uh, you know, like. You know, Joe, he's probably not going to be a very good manicurist. Well, Byron, you would be. That's true. Um, you know, Joe, 
needs to be in a different position. So uh, I don't know how, how I feel about that. Yeah, part about it. It, it. That was a very controversial stance on his, and I don't have a. I don't know. I mean, clearly, he's GE is a very strong company, but um, you know, after it sounds like his employees after the or his management after a few years found it to be. Um, a little bit wasteful at times, you know, cutting 10% of this well, population. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jack Welch was, you know, considered a, you know, an incredible uh, CEO, but I don't know how that would go with today. Today's people are different. They're more empowered. And uh, um, I, I tell you one thing, I wouldn't want to work for a company like that. That uh, No. No, uh, man, if you, you have, uh, the, if you weren't the top performing guy in your department, you'd be worried. Am I, am I in yeah. the bottom 10%? And, yeah. and, and the one thing I really hate about that is then you get people maybe throwing other people under the yeah. bus. Yeah. It changes yeah. the would culture. You wanna, would you want to take a vacation? You know, let's say I'm in sales and I want to go on a two week vacation somewhere. Like I'm not taking a vacation because there goes my numbers. It's, yeah, there uh, you go. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just, uh, that would not be a company I'd work for. Yeah. No, imagine how better off, how how much more successful and how much bigger GE would be today if we had been in charge for the last 20 years. <laughs> you know, maybe that's what we should do. <laughs> no. Hey, you guys are laughing about it, but think about it. Hostile takeover. All three of us know jujitsu. Oh, I we're going to walk right in the corporate office and yeah, be in and, charge. But we'll just butt scoot across the boardroom. I guarantee you nobody if will mess with us. we could get Marty Malloy to start off with a good throw – then I think we're in business, but I don't know if she's going to be on board on your plan, Gary. We'll I, I like your idea. Have Marty Malloy walk in first because she's the tough one. She can throw somebody on her head, and the rest of us will butt scoot in and try to <laughs> entangle the leg. Well, if you find yourself butt scooting in to a situation you would rather not have done that to, and you want to uh, change the way your jiu-jitsu is going, you might check out Six Games for BJJ. It's an audio book I made that uh, has shared some learning concepts that I have found very valuable. And basically what the games advocate doing is changing the goal of your rolling session. You know, typically our goal is to get dominant position, submit somebody. And it's just, it often will change the goal. It'll often will change the route that you get to that goal. And it might be uh, like you might imitate uh, a different grappler, maybe maybe your coach, or maybe one of your teammates, or maybe somebody you've you've watched on um, you know in, uh, online or whatever, and, and you might you might pick up their style and try to blend some of their moves together and, and do that. Another one might be that you know if you always pass guard to the left side, you might try to pass to the right side. If you do a, a throw a certain way, you might switch your grips and try doing it the other way. Uh, you know, and that one, your body knows how to do it. Your brain knows how to do it, but your body's a little bit backwards. So it'll make you kind of rethink uh, how things are working. And sometimes you'll find some real nice discoveries in there because, like, we all have these things set in with the way we, we grapple and we train. And if you always, if I always throw Gary over my right hip and I try to throw him over my left hip, I might find a way to do it that's a little different. And then I could either start throwing him over my left hip or I could alter my right my right side and throw him in this kind of the new way I found. So it's just a way to uh, discover more things about your personal game. So check it out. It's five ninety nine. There's a link to it uh, from our uh, shop that we have, BJJ Brick Shop. Check it out in the show notes. Byron, do we sell bricks in the shop? Uh, we sold. We're sold out of the bricks entirely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We. Because I was just wondering. I think that would be something good to sell, especially with our name. Gary, what I'll do since the new the new year has started, I'll put you in charge of that. Um, you know, Sweet. give you full authorization, and you, you know, you get keep your profits, Gary. So. Well, you know, the cool thing I like about our company, there's three of us, right? So there's no way I could ever be in the bottom ten percent. <laughs> I might be in the bottom thirty three percent. But Byron can never let me go. I think I've been thrown on my head too many times over your left hip, Byron. That might be the case. I'll try it on the other side. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, speaking of getting thrown on your head, um, this is the point in the show where we uh, have a life lesson, where we take something maybe that we've experienced in life and and uh, we talk about that, and then we drag it back on the mats. And Byron and Gary, I, I have already told you the story off the uh, air, but uh, at a previous time. But 
I think there's a jiu-jitsu correlation here. So as all of you all know, I'm a mariner by trade. I work for a company that uh, runs boats, and uh, we provide transportation for cargo and personnel to offshore oil platforms. And uh, <clears throat> we carry, of course, uh, signal flares on the boats for when they're in trouble. And we also have a device called a, a smoke uh, uh, distress signal. And there's usually one on each side of the wheelhouse, and you can launch them. And it's a it's a pretty large canister. And when it gets launched, it's not actually smoke that's coming out. It's some sort of chemical reaction. But a, a, an orange substance comes out, and uh, if the boat were to sink quickly, then uh, an, an airplane or helicopter flying overhead would see this big cloud of orange smoke before they might see a small uh, life ring or something floating in the water. So it's a good way to get the attention of rescuers in the daytime and of course at night you use other methods but anyway these things have a shelf life and an expiration date and we had a vessel that had some flares and two smoke signals expire a couple months ago um, so I just took them home and I was home and my 24 year old son was over and a couple of his friends were over and we we're having a few beers and uh, one of the kids asked you know what that was and we talked about it for a while and one, and one of my son's friends is also a mariner he's, he's like man I've never seen one of those go off <laughs> I said I never have either you know we we drill and we simulate that oh we're going to launch the distress signals and stuff but nobody ever sets them off so uh, so what the hell let's just go ahead and pull the pin so we <laughs> we pull the pin we pull the pin and this orange smoke just just trickles out it's like nothing and it's like two three minutes later okay there's a small cloud of smoke starting to develop in the yard and it's just there's nothing but then two or three minutes later it's still just petering but now this little cloud of smoke is uh, covering my whole yard and it's it's getting into the empty lot next to us and and like 10 minutes later it's still just trickling out this little smoke but now we're like the vacant lot next to us is full of smoke from the ground level to 20 feet high. The two houses beyond that, the house behind us. Um, and, and then this kept going for another five minutes and another five minutes. And it went on for over 20 minutes. And long story short for my listeners is I live in a pr- pretty rare rural area. I don't know all my neighbors that well, but I got to meet about a half a dozen of them that <laughs> afternoon. I got to meet some people from the fire department. I got to meet some people from the uh, sheriff's department. And uh, yeah, by the end of this, the entire neighborhood was covered with a 20 foot blanket of this orange dust. And uh, it's pretty impressive. And the way I think this relates to jujitsu is let's say you decide that, um, Getting stuck in bottom side control and bottom mount is is the the biggest weakness at this point in your game, and you need to remedy that. And you say, I'm going to uh, go to class early every night, and for 10 minutes, I'm going to grab a partner, and I'm going to drill some escapes. And if you do that for two or three weeks and then quit, it's just like when the smoke – signal was releasing smoke for 30 or 40 seconds a little bit of cloud it would have just blown off into the wind you wouldn't even notice it but just like the smoke kept coming it kept coming it kept coming and it became very effective that's how it is with that 10 minutes a night of drilling escapes it's not going to do much over two months but over six months it's going to start to build up and over a year it's going to start to build up and if you just keep going it's really going to build up and even it, with just your daily attendance, if you can only go eight times a month and you think, man, that's barely the two times a week that people say you need. So is this ever going to develop into anything? If you do it long enough, it will eventually develop into something. So that that's my life lesson. Gary, I know that uh, you don't train five times a week. We were talking before that uh, we're both older and maybe two times a week is best. You're making fun of my age. No, no, no. Uh, we're almost. As, I'm almost as old as you, <laughs> Joe. Uh, I do want to say, I've said this numerous times. You won the internet again today. Um, I was really thinking, how the heck are you going to turn this into a jujitsu lesson? And uh, man, you killed it right there. Um, I love it. Uh, uh, if you don't keep doing it, it's just going to peter out. You keep doing it, it's not going to pay dividends right off the bat, but it will in the long run. Uh, you know, the other thing I was thinking is, uh, you know, per a quote, uh, 
you know, be nice to your neighbors. Uh, Joe, I don't know how nice you were to your neighbors with that, but the cool <laughs> thing is you got to meet them all. They probably got to see you're a good guy and, uh, you know, definitely help out. But I was also thinking, you know, if you're going to really work your side control, like you said, you get to class early I and you start working, you know, bottom position and let somebody, you know, try to work your escapes. I do think more, you know, more people will train with you. Some of these schools, you know, have a hundred people in class and uh, you don't know everybody. And, you know, I don't know. I just feel like if you start on the bottom, you know, some more people might not be afraid to go with you. You know, let's say you got some new people and you're a purple belt. Um, sometimes purple belts are afraid or the new people are afraid of purple belts. But if you're always starting in the bottom, you know, coming up, grabbing a single leg, uh, escaping from side control, get your own side control and reset. I don't think you'd ever be, uh, 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 anybody would be afraid to roll with that person. Um, I, and that would also help your training partners work their top game too. And, uh, you know, work their game when you're trying to escape, you know, work wizards, work, you know, pushing the head, um, stuff like that to, uh, to keep you inside control or to keep you on, on the bottom. So, uh, man, I, I really like that lesson, Joe. And I, I think it's pretty funny that you had the guts to try that in your neighborhood and, uh, um, <laughs> glad you didn't get arrested. Yeah, me too. Gary, I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought, brought that up. Um, for our listeners, if you're kind of new to that idea of I'm going to go early and I'm going to grab a training partner and drill some things. And I always encourage people when it comes time to roll, don't be afraid to ask a training partner. If you want to do some positional sparring, start from a specific position. But if you're, you're kind of new bringing that to your gym. Yeah. Uh, start with bottom side control or bottom mount or something. It's probably not the best idea to go in class and say, Hey, I want to uh, drill Ezekiel's from the back. You don't mind if we just start with me on your back, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, though, Joe Byron, uh, many years ago would invite me to come train with him on Friday nights. And, uh, it was me, him and another guy. And I remember, this is the way Byron liked to train. We would start in a fully locked down triangle, and it was my job to try to get out of it. Okay. It's good training. <laughs> fully locked. I remember I couldn't move my head for a week. But no, it was good training. I'm uh, just joking. But no, uh, it took a, you remember those days, Byron? Oh yeah, those were. Uh, he's I'll making it sound like I was Byron's the one that like, did the triangle. You also got to do the triangle. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'll still never forget. Byron's like, "Yeah, we're gonna work fully locked triangles, and we'll have to get out." And I'm like, "Okay, is it too late to turn around?" But what's uh, your, no. What, it, it, what's your methodology for getting out of fully locked triangle? Tap. You don't have a last last ditch. Um, <laughs> you know, I I try to get posture, but uh, if you're you're fully locked, I, I probably can't get posture because you're controlling my head. Um, I like to, uh, basically keep my arms in and throw you down to one side. And, uh, sometimes that'll, uh, open up, uh, open up your grip. But yeah, uh, it, see, see if I can't get posture and I'm not, that's a weakness of mine. Yeah. Uh, I think usually, uh, the, the knee is over my left shoulder and I'll reach up with both hands and grab that yep, knee and then drive it to the ground. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that that's my last ditch. <laughs> that, but you know, I, I really do have trouble. You know, a fully locked triangle, in my opinion, is a very hard thing to get out of. And uh I do that one, like you said, but uh you know, posture is the key. And posture is the key when somebody escapes my triangle. I I notice every time my triangle didn't work, I forgot about posture. For some reason I wasn't controlling that posture. And uh definitely posture is the key. Well, good stuff, guys. And, and Joe, I'm just impressed that you, uh, I don't know, the conversation you had with the fire department or any other sort of uh, government officials, but you did set off a device meant to attract attention in a neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get pretty defensive when my property gets overrun by law enforcement neighbors. So it was a it was an interesting challenge to to manage all that, but I think we did okay. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Marty Malloy to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Uh, Marty has a, a deep history in judo. She's uh, also won the bronze uh, medal in the Olympics in uh, 2012, and you've competed in, in many other large tournaments as well, but that's definitely a, a highlight. And uh, we're excited to have you here, learn a bit about you, learn a bit from you as well. So, Marty, welcome to the podcast. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me, reaching out. It, I'm excited. Well, good. And, and I'm excited to have you here on the show. Um, you, you Let's get in a little bit with your personal history. You started uh, judo, or I, I guess you found judo uh, on a Navy base. Is that correct? Yep. Um, I'm originally from Washington State. Uh, there's an area up there called Puget Sound with an island called Whidbey Island. And there's a naval air base there where my dad was stationed. My three brothers, um, well, my two older brothers joined, and I was definitely on the smaller side, about six years old. They made me wait a little bit till I got bigger, uh, which I don't even think I got much bigger in that time span that they made me wait. And <laughs> um, I, I mean, I picked it up by the time I was six, and I have never stopped except for injury. <laughs> wow, that's uh, it, it's been like a, a cornerstone in your life, basically. Like, there's not many things that any of us can, not anything I can think of for my life that I've been doing since I was six other than eating and sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> well, people always ask me that, like, what would your, what do you think you would have done if you didn't have judo and, or if you'd never done judo? And I always think it's a strange question because how can you imagine your life before, um, this thing that you don't, I don't have any memories before judo. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure I have a five-year-old memory here or there, but like my life, narrative doesn't exist without uh, judo in it. So it's such a hard question for me. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I would be. <laughs> I wouldn't be me. Yeah, it would be, you, you'd be a lot different. It'd be like saying, what would you, and it's different, but what would you be like if you uh, could never get in a vehicle? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't imagine my life without being able to get into a vehicle sometimes to go somewhere. It'd be a lot different. Uh, what, would, what would you be like if you had never uh, found judo? Um, and it's like that with so many things. Uh, but I, I do, uh, to be honest, I do kind of think about that in everyday life, especially in moments where I'm like, wow, this is such an amazing experience. Or if I meet just really amazing people, I'll kind of um, be like, where would I would have never had this experience if it weren't for judo? Like, I do think that. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, getting a little off topic here, but we, sometimes we think that, you know, you meet the right person. This is the best person for me, or you find the right job. And like, I wouldn't be happy doing anything else, but this, or, you know, judo for you, you found this, and it's been a major impact on your life. And it's been a major thing, but who knows what's out there that we didn't find. <laughs> like, totally. like probably your attitude and your work ethic. Um, you know, a lot of that was probably shaped by judo, but some of that would be there as well. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're, we agree. <laughs> Okay, well, it's hard to say starting at six. I mean, that's something that is, is shaping you as a very young person. What was it like? It, was it a kid's program then that you started in, or were you mixed in with everybody? No, it was actually it was kind of a different setup because um, the guy who had originally started the program, George Morris, who was actually my horseback riding instructor around the same time, he, you know, it was just a few people. And this, this judo program doubled as a physical education requirement for the active military dudes. So we weren't your typical program either, where like you just go in and do the moves and do Uchikomi's fit-ins and stuff. Like there was a huge physical training aspect to it, which consisted of like a 30 minute warm up, hundreds of push ups, hundreds of sit ups, drills, agility, all that stuff. So we're special in that way, but it was a pretty good spread of like this, the active military people and then a ton of kids who were just like military dependents. Right. So a lot of my really good friends that I'm, I still know today, I met them on the mat then and their dads were all in the Navy too. Are any of them still doing uh, judo still Actually, training? I think like, you know, recreationally, but funny story is one of my best friend who was my partner my whole time growing up and her brother was really good friends with my brother. He is in the military and he actually has been stationed all around the world and then just ended up an hour South of me here in Cali, uh, randomly. And it's like, I always, every time I see him at like a local judo tournament or I see him, his kids fight, it's just like the most like grounding experience to like know that he and I started judo 24 something years ago together and now we're like right next to each other in a different state <laughs> <laughs> so was what was was there anything going on at that um first uh, judo school that you were training at um or the club I don't know how you, how you describe it but that was different than you would think other places are um no, not really. I mean, other than the physical aspect, and I don't think that that's a small 
I think that's a big difference from the surrounding area clubs because as a six-year-old, I think I was a lot stronger than a lo- most of the six-year-old girls and boys I was fighting. Yeah. Um, j- because I did it. Like I'm, when I say we did a hundred pushups, I didn't like not do them, you know? So it's like a six-year-old with some serious strength. And I think that it attributed a lot to me, my early success when I was a, a kid, because, you know, I won my first tournament, won all my matches really fast. And I was undefeated for many, many years against girls and boys. And I think that that, aspect of my club is kind of what set me up for that when did you start competing um around six a few months after i started in um 92 okay and so oh my that, God, I just said 92. it's just a normal process for uh just your, your training and competing it was just what you were doing yeah, I think I just jumped in. I, I actually don't remember if it was like a discussion or if all the kids, we would just all get in a big van that the Navy base would actually supply and there would be like 10 or 12 kids and my sensei would drive and the moms would be there and we would drive to Seattle a couple hours away, compete, come back. Like that was our that was our system. And can you think of a, a tournament or maybe a match that went well for you that you, it kind of changed the way you thought about this? Yeah, I mean, I was always really competitive. And when you win a lot, you just want to win more, you know, you don't you definitely don't want to get that loss under your belt when you're a kid. And there was this girl named uh, Leilani Akiyama, who I used to fight at every single tournament. And she was equally tough, like, like a beast. And she also wrestled Coincidentally, she's on track to, or she's currently in the process of trying to qualify for the Olympics in 2020 in Tokyo. And we were arch nemesis as a kid because we had to fight each other all the time. And then years later, we did the world tour. We were on world teams together, national teams, and we became almost best friends, which is irony in itself. But I'll never forget there was a match she and I had at one of those local tournaments when we were just barely breaking into like the teenager adolescent um, age bracket, like 10, 11 years old. And we had had so many heated fights that our coaches and people in the local area kind of knew and everyone would be watching and cheering and yelling and neither of us were willing to give anything in. And by the end, I think um, in judo, if there's no score, the referees on the mat back then would all raise a flag these three refs and whoever got the most votes out of three won the match. And at the end I ended up getting it. But as soon as I walked off the mat, I like broke down crying, like followed my coach's arms. And like, I didn't know why I was so confused. And like, I remember talking to my mom about it later. And I think it was just like all that pressure and stress and like moment of not wanting to lose, but the challenge in front of me being extremely, extremely hard and then barely pulling off the win. Um, and I always think back to that because it was kind of like a turning point in terms of like competition setting, like how, how, how hard can you push yourself? You always think you, you, you're at your max, right? Like you've, you've given everything you can. Um, and then you realize that you you can do more and then you can do more beyond that. So I, I definitely think that was like a turning point for me with just that fight at a local tournament against my now really good friend. (laughs) Yeah. Who, by the way, if you wanted to get her on your podcast, I'd love to connect you. She's oh, cool. an awesome girl. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> always on the lookout for for people in in the uh, you know combat sports arena that is, that have uh, interesting stories and yeah, just front load all those judo girls. I'll <laughs> well, good. Um, it, it, it's interesting that you felt such a rivalry, and I think that that in like really any combat sport, I, I know in jujitsu, like sitting around the gym, people will talk about the gym across town or the neighboring, you know, gym in the other state or somewhere where we compete against some, a team a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important to remember that the people at that gym would probably fit in really good at this car, at this other gym. Like we all have something very much in common (laughs) and that's the the martial art that we're training. And if given a chance to become friends, it would very likely happen because look at all the, the people you meet in, 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 uh, you know, martial arts and, and how, a big of a variety of people we are, but we all have that core of, of a, of a solid interest that is, that is very common between us. So it's, it's no a mutual love to yeah. thing, right? Like you guys, people get like that because they feel so strongly about the martial art and the sport. And it's almost like an ownership and a, like a, yeah, like you want to, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but we see that in judo too. Like definitely like 
people talking and discussing other clubs, but not knowing that, like, let's say you dropped all those, let's say you dropped all those judo clubs into a jujitsu tournament. Um, you would see all those judo clubs gravitate toward each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because in that setting, they're, they are of the same entity versus when all that entity is spread out, suddenly it's you versus me and me versus you when it never really was. Yeah. We're, it, it, the team's just changed and now we're on the same team because we're representing judo together or, exactly. you know, like we could do the same thing. Like, like look at MMA. Well, all of us non MMA grapplers <laughs> that are doing jujitsu or judo or wrestling could think about, well, you know, go grapplers, you know? <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Then you suddenly clump it even doing a bear. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Or reverse, you know, the strikers I'm imagining are thinking the same thing. So you want to see, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of funny, but, there are more friends out there than we have a that than we probably realize, and people that seem like they may be and and a good rival. Man, that's somebody you definitely respect. Yes, it's such a good point. And like, there were players that when I was still competing that I felt animosity toward only because because I wanted to beat them. But the other sub level of that is that I was extremely grateful and respectful of them because. Without them, you can never get better. You have to have these people that, you know, challenge you and create difficult situations or styles for you to adapt and grow as a player. How has the women's judo in the United States changed since you started? Um, since I started at six years old? Or yeah, or maybe since you started yeah. taking competitions seriously as far as like when you when you started competing at uh, Pan American Games or, or you know, at World uh, Judo Tournaments or something like that. Like how has, has it changed much since then as far as um, the camaraderie between uh, the players or the, the coaching methods and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, um, so camaraderie, I mean – it's always interesting because there's always a changing of the guards kind of going on in judo where you have the players who have been around for a long time and have a lot of experience um, and have wins under their belt. And when I talk about wins, I'm talking about kind of on the international scene. You could you could probably split the national judo team in half and do a tally of like international wins. And you'll see that the ones who have the international ones are the ones who have been on the circuit the longest. And so the other level is these young, sometimes teen, like 18, 19 year old junior players trancing over into the senior level international scene. And um, I used to feel when I was a teen, 16 years old, and I fought in my first international tournament, which I actually won among a pretty tough field of like Olympians and world team members, of which I had never done any of those things. Um, I felt a little like uh, separate from them, like it, so, so for comparison, if a 18 year old girl now had come up to me two years ago uh, on my last world championships before I retired and like asked me advice or tried to be friendly to me, I would be completely embracing and try and just dump as much knowledge onto them as I could and support as I could knowing how when I was at that similar stage, I didn't feel that same um like openness to the to the senior players and I don't know what caused that shift but it's definitely I think a more united team than it's ever been before um and the what was your question about the coaches just has any uh, coaching or or development of of teaching changed much that you've noticed as far as trying to get better in a short amount of time I guess yeah, so that's that's a tough question because we don't have centralized training in the United States for judo and all the clubs are spread out across the whole country doing it their own way. So um, I know for me, my coaching at San Jose State University, where which is the judo team that I've, I've been at for the, almost my entire judo career, except when I was a kid, um, we have had... <laughs> we've had a lot of coaches in the 15 years or so since I've been here. And, um, some would say that's a negative thing. The, the, the lack of consistency in a way. Um, but I actually think that it was another thing that benefited me because when you have all these different resources, you've got different styles and techniques and even ways of thinking about the sport. So I looked at it as a way to like, kind of take something from all of them or at least try what they, you know, because if you think of any martial artist, they've gone through their whole career and they've zeroed in on the thing that 
is most effective for them and how to do it and how to make it effective, right? So I think with any high level martial artist, you can kind of grab them and be like, show me that thing that you do really good. And then they can show it to you and you might not like it or be good at it, but there might be some small aspect of it that you do like, even if it's just like grabbing the sleeve with your palm facing down versus facing, facing up, something simple, right? Um, because I had so many of those players to get exposed to over that time, I feel like I became a more well-rounded player, if that makes sense. Yeah, you, you got to see a variety of uh, different, uh, not just techniques or or, or styles, but a, a variety of, of teaching methods uh, and, and, and shown a, a, a wide range of things. And you got to, over that time, I'd imagine you got to plug certain things into to your system. Exactly. Yeah, plug it into your system. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, if I had you on here, we didn't talk about the Olympics. I would feel like I left something huge out. <laughs> Tell me about um, your Olympic experience from from getting there and, 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 and like embracing what you're going through to, to getting on the mats and, and, and getting, uh, getting bronze. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's always fun to talk about now in perspective, like with looking back from a broader view, but for as long as I remember, I wanted to go to the Olympics and it's really not easy. The qualification process, um, is extremely difficult. You have to be top 20 in the entire world in order to qualify. And, that might not sound that hard to maybe a typical American, but to the rest of the world where judo is really, really popular, that's, that's not an easy undertaking. So, um, I, when I finally made the Olympic team, it was kind of like, uh, you want to be happy with just like, I did it like that thing I shot for my whole life. I did it, but there was a whole nother part of me that was new that I would never be happy with just making a team. I never wanted to just be on the team. I wanted to be Olympic champion and, in 2008, I had missed the Olympic team by a very, very small margin. Um, and I had gone home from that. I think it was the Pan American Championships. It was I just needed to get a bronze medal, and I would have gone to Beijing, and I just messed up. The pressure or the stress got to me. And uh, one of my trainers, Aton, who has worked with me my whole career, was like, you know, if you had uh, if you had made that team, you wouldn't have been ready. And And I thought about it and I was like, he's so right. Do I want to just be someone who shows up or do I want to go there and like get the job done? And I kept that mentality over the next quad going into 2012. And I had these great results that guaranteed that I was on the team. And just for perspective, like there's so many, um, there's a a not fun situation that a lot of American judo players go through where you're wondering if like, you're going to get the wild card and make the team like you didn't get enough points to qualify, but we get a wild card for every country, you know, and like, that's a really scary position to be in. Cause it's like, you're good. You could go or you couldn't go. And so I knew for sure I was going to go. Um, and I was like heaven on earth. I was like walking on clouds. <laughs> so excited. Um, after I, I actually took a bronze medal at the Paris grand slam in, in February, which essentially guaranteed I was going to the Olympics in August. Um, and then like the next week I got hurt (laughs) and I was sidelined for three months to the build up to London. So you have to think of perspective of like, you wait your whole life to get here, you finally make it and then you get injured and you're sidelined before the most important tournament of your career. Wow. Um, yeah, it was really, it was a really tough time for me and I did my therapy. I did everything I could. I was doing judo with one arm, like strapping my, it was my shoulder that I hurt. So I couldn't like lift it at all. And so I would just strap my arm to my chest and do the techniques and the drilling with just whatever I could with just the one arm, you know. And then I got well enough to fight in like a warm up tournament in Prague right before London. And I ended up um, going to the final and going into London, me and my best friend Kayla Harrison, also on her first Olympic team, ended up taking gold at this Olymp- that Olympics. And then 2016, um, we were just enjoying the whole experience and I got the draw, you know, you wait to see who you're going to fight first. And I came to find out that I was going to fight the number two girl in the world first from Portugal. And I had lost her six times previously and never even managed to get a score on her, like score any points during the, the our matches. And that was kind of like a huge letdown at that moment. It was kind of like you get all the way there and then you forget, like you kind of forget that that's not the hardest part. The hardest part is still to come, you know, which is you think would be obvious, but you kind of do get caught up in that, um, that atmosphere. 
Um, and then over the next few days while I was waiting to fight, I just started feeling really like pissed off more than anything that I was allowing myself to become less confident just because of this stick in my side that she had been that I hadn't been able to beat her. Um, and then I ended up winning the fight. We had to go into overtime and I threw her for a score in the overtime, which is just kind of like sudden death. You automatically win the fight if you score in overtime. Um, and then I steamrolled through my second fight, third fight against Russia. Um, I lost a semifinal to a Romanian girl who I also had never been able to beat. And um, then I had to go on and fight for bronze. And that's a really hard thing to do after you have won all day and then you've lost. You've basically, in your mind, you kind of think about it as I've lost the Olympics because you have, because in order to win the Olympics, you have to get gold. Um, and the idea of just fighting again was... Like, I, I almost didn't want to, I would say. Like, some part of me was, like, just, like, end this misery kind of thing. But I had Jimmy Pedro, who um, you had Travis Stevens on. That's his coach. And Kayla's coach also, and who I had trained with for a long time over the years and in the build-up to London. And he has a um, two Olympic bronze, maybe an Olympic bronze fifth and an Olymp- a world bronze fifth. He fought for bronze twice at two major events and lost. And he was like, listen, Marty, like, <laughs> if you think how you feel right now is bad, he's like, if you go out there and like, you don't turn this around and get your stuff together for this, uh, this bronze medal match, you're going to feel a thousand times worse. And like, considering how bad I felt, I was kind of like floored by the concept that there was a lower, <laughs> a, well, like a lower point yeah. you could get to, you know? Um, yeah. And that's kind of what it took for me to like refocus and like it. And when I say refocus, I only had like 30 minutes to go out and fight. Um, and the girl I had to fight was the Olympic champion from Beijing from the previous Olympic. She had won it. <laughs> so it was like, it wasn't like someone else like me who had made their first Olympic team and was like, you know, I can do this. Yeah. It was somebody who's like, no, 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 I did this. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, Yeah, but then I ended up beating her um, about two minutes in, halfway through the fight with my kind of my signature move, which is a move that I had been working and developing, developing, working on for for years. And, you know, I'd gotten to the point where I could do it kind of instinctually, where if the scenario of when you would execute it presents itself, I could do it without thought. And that's exactly what happened in that match. She had kind of stepped out and had her legs really wide. Um, and so I faked a forward throw, which caused her to like sit back on her feet. Um, and then I swept out her foot. So she fell like flat on her back and they called Epone, which is like equivalent to a uh, knockout in boxing. It ends the fight automatically in judo. And that was it. I won. And oh my God. <laughs> and it's crazy thinking about it now that that was seven years ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Amazing journey. And I just... Going back to when you first started talking about this, in 2008, you didn't quite make it. And then you you called it, I think you said a quad, is that it? Like Mm -hmm. the four-year period between Olympics, right? Yep, exactly. That sounds like a crazy amount of time. (laughs) Oh, it's so long. Well, so I'm glad you mentioned that because even though there's four years in between, the qualification process starts two years before. Okay. So everyone who's going to go to um, Tokyo 2020 – they started qualifying in 2018. Okay. Which is crazy. That's crazy. That's so long. <laughs> yeah. That 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 is an interesting process. I mean, uh, I'm process. not the same person I was in 2018 anymore. <laughs> yeah, I I <laughs> How much do you think you you what was that pro that for that quad like? I mean, I I can't imagine having to wait 4 years to make something like this happen. Or or try to make something like this happen again to make the team. Um, it was hard. Yeah, it was. It, I was really disappointed until, like I told you, I talked to my trainer, and like at that point, I kind of became um, like pissed off for greatness, kind of thing. Okay. Like, <laughs> like I'm I'm this is, I'm never gonna feel this way again, kind of thought. And if you think about it in terms of a quad, then that means for two years you have time to just develop, which is find your weaknesses, improve on your, improve them, um, come up with strategies. Cause in judo, like, you know who you're going to fight before you fight them. You know what their techniques are. YouTube, you can watch everyone you're ever going to fight a million times until you, there's, you don't, you understand everything they do, you know? So there's definitely a development period where you just get better. 
and then you have to start thinking strategically about which tournaments you go to and um, how, what points you need to accumulate, which means what medals do you need to take to make those two years at the end for you to qualify. Interesting. And, and what is the, the, the training, is it kind of different phases of training? Like those first two years, you're just self-development and changing and making yourself. In, and then the next two is, is hitting that tournament circuit and getting points towards getting that, that ranking or, or what is it? So part the of that, part of that training is competing. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's not just like, like you wouldn't just stop going to tournaments. It would be more like thinking strategically about tournaments. So I always say this now, I coach at San Jose State now as an assistant coach and we have a strong girls team right now. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not touting my own, tooting my own horn. Um, and I always tell them like, you need to understand where, what level to fight at. So th- th- this is a really like obvious example, but you wouldn't let a white belt go fight at the the IBJJF uh, worlds, right? Or in they yeah. couldn't, or I guess there's a white belt division there, huh? Like different <laughs> yeah, yeah. Judo, you don't have that. Um, you wouldn't let them compete way outside their their skill and ability. Yeah, I, I guess they couldn't. They wouldn't be allowed to be in a black belt division. But in judo, the way that works is like you could be a black belt in the U.S., but that does not mean that you should be fighting at a tournament in Europe because the Europeans are so much stronger than us. So like you need to understand your level and then like work up from there. So um, it does me no good as someone who just missed the Olympic team in 2008 to go to the hardest tournament on the planet in Paris, right? That's the tournament I mentioned that I got a bronze and it qualified me for London. 2008, it, that wasn't helpful for me. But lower level tournaments right below that prepared me to be ready to take a medal at that tournament by 2012. Does that make sense? Why is that preparing you differently than actually getting that that time with the the people who are going to be there? That's a really good question. So in judo, we're pooling systems. So if you don't win your first fight, you're done. Like you flew 20 hours to Europe. You paid $3,000 for a flight. You paid three thousand thousand dollars for a hotel for a week, yeah, and you fought for two minutes, and then you went home. So that is bad on so many levels there, like I just mentioned. But not only that, it completely kills your confidence. As like, like, where do I stand in the in the rankings of all these people that I have to beat to achieve my goals? And it just kind of goes, no, no, you're at the very bottom. But if you go to a Pan American Cup in Peru, that not a lot of people go to, but a lot of the people there that you would fight are at your same level. Instead of going out in the first round, you can get three solid rounds in and maybe you'll win two matches, lose two matches, but you've actually got 20 minutes worth of video for you to go back and be like, oh, these are the mistakes I made or these are the things I did well and then go to the dojo and work on those things so they don't happen the next tournament. And then you have like actually see a development process taking place where it's like two steps forward, only one step back. But if you had gone to that hardest tournament on the planet with all the top players, the likelihood that you get out of the first round is very low. And I'm not saying this as an opinion. This is like you could look at those those statistics, those results for yourself. Um, that kind of is what happens to a lot of Americans just because we're not as strong as the rest of the countries that are showing up there. So to give yourself better odds and develop over time and not – make yourself be like, I suck. <laughs> like, cause that's how I've said, I'm not saying that people don't, I say that to myself when I went above my range, I was like, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much I suck. And it's like, no, I don't suck. I'm just going way beyond where I should be. And I'm not taking the necessary steps to like work up to that point versus just diving right in. Th- does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm, gu- I'm guessing when, you you got bronze. She was from Italy, right? And mm-hmm. and and yeah. And the when you're throwing her, you're not thinking about how she won gold la- the, the the last time. <laughs> like that's not in your mind. You're you've you've overcome any sort of uh, like thing that you shouldn't be on the mat with this person. And right, and, totally. and you're taking it. You really you really took it to her the whole match. It's like. It seemed like, and I could be evaluating this incorrectly, but it seemed like you were the aggressive one the whole time. You were, you were doing things. You were being, you were there to win, and um, and it was just like, like I, yeah, I don't know. I, it just seemed like no, mentally exactly, you were definitely exactly in that game. Yeah, totally. And 
and for me, like a huge aspect of every fight I ever have is like that mental preparation before you step on the mat. And like, I put myself in a confident position in my mind of like, they're not better than you. They didn't train harder than you. I don't believe their judo is better than mine. You know, like, so once you, you place that like level in your mind of like who they are versus you, like forget that she's an Olympic champion. When I first realized I had to fight the Olympic champion, I wasn't like, oh my God, this is awesome. You know, I was like, oh, that shit. (laughs) (laughs) But the second thought after that is like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like she may have won that day and you know, the Olympics are an incredible phenomenon and uh, a really good friend of mine, Sayaka Matsumoto, who I used to train with and she was Olympian in Beijing in 2008 and she always used to say anyone can win on any day and like that was her like her go-to and because we would talk about like they're so good or this person's so good and she was like no screw that like there are so many things that come into play to make you successful on on that day it's your draw it's if you got to the tournament in time and had time to warm up properly and didn't feel stressed and you weren't off focus and you didn't slip on the mat and throw yourself like there's so many things um so I always would go back to like anyone can win any kind of day and then I would start let putting them on the same level as myself of like they're not better than me like I do not believe in my core that they're better than me and so then it becomes a question of like I'm just never gonna give up like I'm gonna do I'm gonna go as hard as I can the whole time and I'm never gonna lose focus and it's interesting that you say that you could tell that I was like more focused and or aggressive in that match because I felt that way as well and I also looked across the mat at my opponent as the match was starting and in the back of my mind I thought that she looked nervous and that helped me as well I went wait a minute <laughs> like she's nervous about me and I could have been wrong maybe she wasn't nervous at all that's just how I interpreted her face um but it helped me because I was like oh she's nervous okay, like I'm, she knows I'm a force to be reckoned with. Like I'm right, you know, like, and I, this sounds like a long conversation, but that all happened in like seconds. <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing when you notice, you, you know, you, you're getting up and getting ready to reset and you might notice like, wow, they look really tired. <laughs> yeah, like I feel exactly. great. And that's the, that's something that is, is a time to just hit that, hit that uh, gas pedal, you know, all the way to the floor. And if they look tired and, and, and you feel great, that's that, that's a good sign and and if they look nervous and you feel confident really? wow that's a great position to be in and that's a great point to make too about looking tired because even now when i coach kids or i teach seminars or at practice when we're pushing like for a tournament season and we're peaking where we're going as hard and long as we're going to go before tapering off um i always tell i say don't bend over don't put your hands on your knees don't put your hands on your head or like act like you're tired. I was like, no matter what you're feeling on the inside, you have to keep everything on the outside together because your opponent is, is like sucking that up. And we all know that, like we all, we've all seen that scenario of somebody just dying and you going, Oh, okay. I'm not like that. So I got this, you know, Yeah. <laughs> like you never want to give somebody that advantage over you. Yeah. If you ever like, in, it happens a lot in jujitsu tournaments where the competitors will get off the mat, and then the ref will say, "Let's get back in the middle," and then they both like crawl to the middle of the mat like as lazily as possible. <laughs> it's like I always am an advocate: get up, jump up and down a couple of times, roll your neck, and walk like proudly to the middle of the mat and look at this person like we're getting, I'm ready, <laughs> like because I mean that happens a lot. One. Yeah. Don't don't give him that extra energy by you looking tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like yeah, that's a freebie. Like, don't give him that freebie because it, it really. Ma- we all know the saying like ninety. It's ninety nine percent, one percent physical, ninety nine percent mental. You know, like there is a lot of truth behind that. It, it, if you can like elevate your mental game, I think that it gives more benefits than than most people realize. You mentioned that Europe has really strong players. Why is it that they have such? Um, is it just like they compete against each other a lot more? Or yeah, that's one. There's I think there's three main reasons. Is uh, one most European countries have centralized training, okay. which means all their top players to get funding, to get sponsorships, to get on the national team. You got to train all in the same place as the rest of them. Germany, Italy, Russia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, 
uh, France, of course, they all do centralized training. So you've got the cream of the crop of an entire nation all in one place. Secondly, they're all in close proximity. So you don't even have to hop on a plane in some cases to get across an international border and train with another country, another centralized country, right? Um, and then third, is, yeah, no, I guess those are the two main reasons. They, they, they work together and centralize. And they also access each other a lot easier. And so when, that doesn't just talk about training. You can access all those other countries for competition, too. And the majority yeah. of the international events that qualify you for the Olympics are in Europe. So um, with us, we have to be really choosy because of budgets and distance of where we're going to go and when. So this goes back to what I was saying about, like, don't fight above your level because – they've got this huge advantage over there and you're basically going over into their territory traveling for 24 hours minimum, right? Even if it takes you just a day to get there, I don't care if your flight's 10 hours, that's 24 hours of traveling. Yeah. If you put it all together, you know, they're doing none of that. They're waking up in their own bed, hopping on a little hopper flight. They're in another country by an hour, you know, like all those little things matter. Yeah. That, that does add up when you're trying to hit a peak performance. Um, did you sleep well? Are you in your time zone? <laughs> yeah, I just remember, like, where everyone's cutting weight, too. So not only are you traveling, you're starving and dehydrated. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on there. Do you think there's – we could look at the – what is largely a negative as far as, you know, it's it, we don't have centralized training. Um, we're, we're not able to hop into – to eight different countries and compete on a, you know, in a short bus trip or whatever. And, and, and the fact that they all know each other's game so well and that you could maybe come in and, and they wouldn't know quite what you're going to do, or is that all ruined by the internet? Yeah, no, I mean, I I would say there's no substitute for hands on. Right. So like if you did, if you and I did live sparring 10 times, um, over a month, whatever, but versus you and I have competed against each other one time. Like, I definitely think those 10 times I worked out with you are more valuable than what I got from you in just that one live tournament event because tournament, everyone is different. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard about like dojo fighters, people who kill it in the dojo, but then just flop in tournament Sure. and vice versa. They don't seem to work hard in the jojo and they don't put a lot of effort in, but when it comes to tournament, they're ferocious and they get wins, you know, like that's definitely a thing in judo. So, um, yeah, I totally forgot what I was saying. No, it's just it, it does <laughs> it, it. There's different. That's a mental switch, like you were saying. It's ninety nine percent mental. The, the the ability of that person is still there. Whether you're, if you're killing it in the gym and you go and you have a terrible tournament, your ability didn't go away. It's it's that uh, mental game that that you're missing the step. It's not that you didn't you know do a throw oh, correctly. Right, right. And to your question of like, like I do think that just going with somebody regularly and train, you get to know their kind of whole arsenal of what they do and their go-to moves. And so when you do meet them in the tournament the next time, like that's a, that's a heated match because you both know what each other do and what their goals are, what throw they want to get, et cetera. Versus um, we show up over there and we can only get so much from a YouTube video, right? Like uh, there's a thing in judo, I, I'll watch a fight and I'll be like, Oh, they look strong. And the person will be like, no, they were physically really weak. You know, they're like, I just couldn't get past blah, blah, blah. So, like, that's the thing you can't know from watching. I was completely off. They look strong to me. But they were like, no, actually, their physical ability wasn't that much. And that goes, like, I could be like, they look really weak. And they're like, no, they're so freaking strong. Interesting. <laughs> Which is another thing you can only get from getting your hands on them. Yeah. That, that uh, yeah, you, you have no idea how, how strong someone's grip is until you can't break it with both your hands. Yeah. <laughs> I've experienced that. Uh I, having attended some judo seminars, I, I was once uh, getting thrown around, and, and the guy told me, he said, if, if we were boxing and, and, and we're trying to you know, do some sparring, and all you're doing is throwing heavy punches, your, your head is down, you're throwing heavy punches, what are my choices? I got to hit you hard. Like, I, 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 th- there's nothing I can do about it. You're, I'm going to have to uh, deal with what you're doing. And he said, if you want to work a little bit and, 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 and work on your grips and work on your technique a little bit, this will be a lot easier for you. <laughs> like, yeah. like, oh, okay. And so it, it was a different 
mode of, and that's what in jujitsu we do that a lot. Like we don't, I don't spar as hard as I can every time. But when I was trying to do a little bit of judo, I got a little bit too excited. I was getting thrown. I was coming too hard. And it was like he had no other choice. I gotta throw this idiot. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> like, and so that's. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Like that to me was really profound. Like, yeah, I'm, I am messing up this training, and he's just having to deal with with me being too excited. And and this is how he does that to protect himself. Like, is, is that? I thought that was really profound when he told me that. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm an idiot here. Is that a common thing that that people train like too hard or too aggressively when they when really I I don't know anything about it, so I should back down the step and, and try to try um, to figure the technique out I learned today. Yeah, no, it's a really good point because to me, I definitely think there are, there are like landmarks or like you need to get to this point before you shouldn't be going hard, 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 unless you're doing the technique a hundred percent correct. Okay. That's my belief because I, I look at it this way. Like I talked to you about my Olympic match where I was like, I threw her with an instinctual throw, Right like a throw that I, I don't need to think about to execute. My body just does it. So yeah. to get there, the, 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 the unconscious act has to be correct. So the way you make an unconscious act correct is by drilling it right. And doing it really, really hard. So the drilling needs to be specific and precise. So if you were doing it really, really correct and really, really hard, you would have thrown the guy. Right. Yeah. But you, you couldn't, he just had to like put you down. Yeah. (laughs) So so it's like, I always would say like to, it's not bad to go hard and like be aggressive and stuff like that. But like, you have to take back a step and be like, what habits am I forming right now? Like, are my feet in the right place? Are my grips in the right place? Are my steps in the right place? Am I doing off balance? Like all those aspects have to be precise and intentional um, and then you add in the hard drilling part. Now I know when you're doing live sparring, like it's, it, that's really hard. Like you're just trying to like take the chance. So the other side of that I would say is like, you got to just try it to figure out why you're doing it wrong too. Like there's those, both of those aspects, but you don't want to build bad habits. Like I spent a lot of my judo career undoing things that I had trained wrong for so long, but my body was already doing them unconsciously. Like how do you untrain that? Yeah. <laughs> like, you got to replace it with the right thing. Yeah, that's and just because uh, something worked doesn't mean that, that it was yeah. done correctly. And uh, like uh, Marty, I'm a I'm a firefighter, and and that's, that's cool. a thing that we talk about a lot. Just because you know you did this thing, this this technique or this method, this particular way, and it and it worked out okay, doesn't mean it was the safest way possible. Doesn't mean it was the best for the people that were inside the building. Like everything needs to be reevaluated and just mm. because your throw worked or your arm bar worked doesn't mean you actually did it the best way that you right. could. Right. It, it's so subjective too. Were they going with a white belt or a purple belt? You know, like it's, you do that all day. Yeah. <laughs> so how has that transition been from being a top tier competitor to being, uh, retired and continued, uh, continue on in the sport? Yeah, it's tough. It's it's definitely an adjustment of like your your mental thinking. Um, I think I'm an extremely driven person, and I kind of always need to be working toward a goal. Um, and so, as soon as I realized that I was never going to compete again, there was kind of like a empty void in that future point in my mind of like what I'm working toward. Um, but luckily, like I had every intention of moving into the professional world after I retired. So when I did my, I got my undergrad degree a year before the London Olympics. And then I got my master's degree a year before the Rio Olympics. So I was doing those in tandem with my training at San Jose state. And, um, I basically shifted my focus to moving into that professional world when I was done with that. But as well as working as an assistant coach, um, with the San Jose state judo team, which has been a great way to channel that, um, that goal oriented part of me that instead of working towards something for myself, I try to think of how I can help all the people at our judo club work toward their own goals in judo as well. And, um, it's a lot more rewarding than I thought it would be, you know, skipping onto the other side of, from going from athlete to coach. Um, it's also extremely challenging and frustrating, uh, cause they never just do what you tell them to. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny cause like I was on the other side for so long with coaches saying like, just do it this way and do it this way. And, yeah. um, 
it's hard. It, it, it's a relationship, you know, and um, I'm really enjoying it now. But I will say for the first year or so, maybe 2018, it was like a really unsure time of like, where am I going next? And what do I want to achieve for myself? Because it was always the Olympics. It, it was always be Olympic champion, you know? Yeah. It, that's, uh, I'm glad you're still on the mat and, 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 uh, and, and helping out others and, and, and doing something that has, I mean, you, I think it would be hard to actually, I mean, you've been doing this since you were six, <laughs> like yeah, <laughs> would, would avoid that would be if you, some people retire from whatever sport, and they like if football's a good one. You retire from football, you're you're too beat up and and damaged. You're, you're not going to play casual football. Nobody mm-hmm. does that. You retire from a lot of sports. Right. It's just you're done. It, the beauty of, of of this is you'll probably be able to coach it for as long as you could stand up and 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 tie a belt around your waist. Like, yeah. Well, I, I you know I they we in judo we say judo is a way of life because um it's not just about what you do when you step on the mat. It's kind of about the person you become and your ideals and um the way you treat people. So like it, there's no separating judo from me. So I, I go and I coach and I teach seminars and like I my husband as well is also a judo instructor and we we always say that we can't imagine a life without where judo isn't like the main driver which is like even though i'm retired i still say that because we do judo almost every single day um and i teach seminars all the time and i get so so much joy from showing up in these at these clubs of these with all these kids and little girls and coaches that i've never met before and saying like this is what worked for me and this is why it worked for me and this is the advice I could give to you to if this is your goal as well and all of these people are are so kind and so welcoming and they have the same love for judo that I have um and so like it's it's so rewarding it's it's almost as rewarding as it would how it felt to win tournaments to go to tournaments and and win a medal because like to me, I'm helping whoever these potential people are who had those same dreams that I have possibly have those same wins, you know? And, um, the, when little girls come up to me and are like, are you Marty Malloy? (laughs) And like, they're just like in a little yellow belt and they know who I am first of all, because of judo and they're excited to see me. It like, it makes it all worth it. That's, That's cool. Um, Tell me a little bit about how you run a seminar. If if someone's going to go to a, a Marty Malloy seminar, what should they expect? Oh, cool. Good question. I've never had that one before. Um, typically in a two to three hour Marty Malloy seminar, I divide it up into two parts, which is groundwork and standing work. Um, a lot of my judo, you know, I won my Olympic medal with a throw, but I would say 70 to 80% of my wins were on the mat with um, arm bars or pins. Um, so I teach a lot of groundwork and transition. I show the Marty Masher, which is a technique that I created. Um, and not many people have seen it. <laughs> and I basically go over my favorite techniques and why I find them to be as good as they are on the ground side and the standing side. And then I always work one-on-one with all the, um, attendees and do like a question answer set up as well at the end where people can get to know me better. Kind of like how we're doing now. Cool. Uh, Marty Masher, can you describe at all the the position or what's happening in that? <laughs> um, it's kind of hard. It, okay, it's a it's a, it's a turnover. So I know in jujitsu, people don't typically go into a turtle position on their hands and knees because it's just giving up the back. Um, but in judo, that's a common transition phase from standing to ground. Is they'll fall or do a throw or you'll do a throw and they'll end up in a ball on the mat. And it's just a turnover I do from that position to get a pin. Um, And it mashes your shoulder and arm up in a really painful way that makes it almost impossible to escape. And it's based off the the move itself is called Ushiro Keisugitame, which basically means reverse Keisugitame, which is uh, basically the basic judo scarf hold pin. It's a reverse version of that where you're you're with your back to your, your opponent. Did I explain that? Good? I think so. I mean, I, I'm familiar with those, and uh, I'm hoping the judo player who's listening to this is like, I get it, Marty. I know exactly. <laughs> <what you meant. laughs> 
That's that's cool. Um, yeah, it, it sounds interesting, and and uh, yeah, attend a seminar if you want to learn that one. <laughs> well, I always tell the attendees, I was like, I created that move the year I retired, and it had like a 89, 90% success rate, meaning like nine out of 10 people I tried it on, I pinned them and they could not escape. Um, but I just didn't have time to execute it on the world stage because I was done competing. So when I go to seminars and I teach it, I tell them, if you provide a video of yourself doing the Marty Masher in a live tournament setting, I have a grand prize for somebody. And I have yet to uh, get that video. <laughs> That's a cool incentive, though. Yeah, because it's such a good move. Uh, so, uh, y- you mentioned that you're, uh, you're working, you're not just doing judo full time. Is that working full time too? Yes. What do you do if you don't mind me asking? Oh, no, of course not. Um, so I'm technically a digital marketing specialist. I work for this awesome company. It's called my health teams. And, um, they actually recruited me not long after, I retired. I was actually on the lookout and doing interviews and they reached out and they were like, we think you are, would be a great fit for this role. And actually today is my two year anniversary of working there. So I went straight from competing to working. Um, we're located in San Francisco and we basically create social networks for people who are living with chronic diseases. So, um, if you went to the doctor and you found out that you have this disease, that's never going to go away and it's going to, cause constant pain and insomnia and not a lot of people around you are going to understand what you're going through. We create social networks specifically for people living with that disease. So we now support 35 different diseases. Um, we have 2 million members and my job is to use social media, magic of social media to, to get people to learn about our sites and become members. Wow. That, that is awesome. And, it, uh, w- what a way to help people out. Um, my, my neighbor, um, old, little older gentleman had, he had to have a surgery and he was real nervous about it and, and, and all this stuff. And, and I talked to him, you know, every now and then over the fence <laughs> and, uh, he's like, one week he comes back, he's pirate. I found this thing online and, and he's connected with people. There's not a lot around us that have to have the surgery, but online there's a ton. And it's mm-hmm. just like, it was a relief for the guy to be able to ask just, just stupid questions that you don't want to ask your doctor or you don't think about or like, how's this going to affect my, you know, blank in life or whatever. And it was just like an amazing thing uh, for him. It was such a relief to find something like this as far as um, just kind of put his life back and on track and let him know, you know, where he's going in the future. And, uh, and, and say, I think we can feel this in the, in the martial arts community as well. I know that there's going to be that there's lots of judo groups. There's probably women's judo groups. There's probably subdivisions of that where people go, get in and help each other out and where the world used to be so big and it used to be, you know, only people that, that do this thing. There's only two of them in my city. And now that now you have access to the world and it's just, it's a lot, seems yeah, a lot smaller. You hit, you hit the nail on the head. And, and that's the thing is like, I think from our two co-founders both had a, a uh, someone close to them in their family who had suffered from, you know, an autoimmune condition or disease that, um, and they were just, they felt so alone and they realized that there were, we could bring all these people who feel this way together to share resources and information and support. And the amazing thing we found is that, you know, you expect people to go onto these social communities and just talk about, um, you know, treatments and symptoms and all that, which they do. But, they're mainly just there to check in and say hello. And, you know, not everyone has access to good treatment and doctors and care. Um, but you can find all this information in, in, on our site. So it's been extremely rewarding. I, I, you know, I just say like, I can't believe that I actually I work at this great company and that we get to see the real life impact for the, the members who, who use our site. So it, it's been a great experience. And, I feel really lucky because I'm, like I said, I'm a, I'm goal oriented person. You know, I always want to be working towards something and, um, our, our founders do a good job of helping me learn and grow as a professional too. And it's been just a great experience. Good. That, that's awesome that you've uh, found that and are, uh, have that to put your energy towards. Cause I know you have a lot of good energy that can move things. <laughs> well, I mean, they, I think that was one of the reasons to be honest that they were like, you can do this is because you got to remember if we have 35 websites, right. That means we have 35 Facebook pages and 35 Twitters. 
And so they were like, we think you have the stamina to handle all of that <laughs> because of your your hardworking diligence and background. And I was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> 35 usernames and logins. <laughs> Yeah, I'm all about uh, them save passwords. Yeah, that would that's definitely helpful. One thing that I have written down here that I wanted to ask you because I've uh, never asked it of another Olympic athlete, but I always think of it when we stop talking. Is there some sort of Olympic athlete development program that talks to you or teaches you about, I don't know, nutrition or developing a mindset or even how to do interviews uh, on TV and that sort of thing? Is there anything like that or are you just – just doing your best that you can. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I would say I would say that you would you should think about it more in terms of organizations. So like um USA Judo has its own initiatives in terms of like how we represent our national governing body, but once you become an Olympic team member, um you go through some of that training. So when we went to London, I had to actually here in the Bay Area go to a 2-day training where we talk about like if they ask you about the war in Iraq, this is how you respond. If you if you don't want to talk about it, you know, okay. like at any point you can be like, oh, blah, 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 this is my opinion. But they were like, listen, when you get to the Olympics, all the eyes are on you. Every media outlet in the world, you need to be very aware of everything you do and everything you say because it's under a huge spotlight. And I found them extremely helpful because I was around in 2008 when social media was not what it is now and. Um, people were just learning about the way what you say online can come back to bite you. And so they would talk about that. They would talk about um, how we had to have a whole course on like how to hold the flag. Um, like you never, you never are supposed to drape it. it. It's not clothing. You do not drape the flag around your shoulders and how to hold it correctly. So it's not backwards, you know, because a lot of we're the, we're the most successful Olympic country on the planet. So there's a lot of times when Americans are, holding a flag after winning medals and stuff like that. So we go through a lot of that training. And then one thing the USOC has now, which I think is amazing, it's called ACE and it's athletic. Uh, it's a something platform that basically connects you to resources that help you while you're an athlete and after you're an athlete about how to get internships, how to get free tuition and um, scholarships and training and workshops and um, job interviews and nutrition, all of that. So I guess to answer your question, yes. <laughs> um, but it comes in like kind of different buckets, if you will. Yeah, that makes sense. And then obviously any Olympic athlete, any Olympian, a United States Olympian can go to any Olympic training center and be treated, cared for, work out um, free of charge. Do you have a favorite training center that you had that you would go to? I only went to the OTC in Colorado Springs. Yeah. Um, so I definitely love it. It's a great place. But I've also trained at Lake Placid, which is, you know, up in the snow. Um, also nice, you know, anything the USOC runs I found has been very, you know, good food, good facilities, organized, you know, all that good stuff. Cool. What would you say to, uh, a a young girl, like, uh, I don't know, six or a little bit older, somebody maybe listening to this podcast is thinking about doing judo. Who would you say to them, like to help them get them to their first year? Oh, their first year. Um, I would like, it's always good to, uh, a really good question. So I noticed that I always say that it's hard to start judo as an adult because there's no way to make an adult who's never been thrown to the floor feel comfortable about being thrown to the floor versus if you start when you're six, all you know is being thrown to the floor and you don't think about it. But as an adult, because you have reasoning and pain from life, <laughs> you do think about those things, you know? <laughs> So I always kind of say, like, don't give up too soon because the first day a lot of new people, white belt adults, have never kind of done that kind of intense training before. And I say intense. You're like, well, if they're white belt, why are they doing intense? I was going to say that even just the warm-ups sometimes are enough to make somebody sore the next day if you're not accustomed to it, you know? So I would say, like, give it a week or two to, like, let the bumps and the sores and your body adjusting to this, like, hands-on sport um, let that all kind of ease away and you build a little endurance for it before you walk away from it. You know, you said one year, but I noticed that it's hard to keep them after even a month or okay. so. Yeah. You just get them, get them past that first month. Yeah. And, and you know, I, judo is, you, you got to think about what you're doing. Like you gotta, you gotta be present and like intentional in what you do. So 
I would say like look at judo not as like a workout but like it's a learning experience like you're going to be learning a lot of new things and ways to do things and embracing that and I think makes it more enjoyable versus like I got to get through this if that makes sense yeah yeah that, that's a good way to think about it. another question I had for you are are there standards to the mats like are some mats like a lot harder than others or is there like a one mat company that you prefer over the others yeah I mean there's a few mat companies out there. I've actually, I'm one of my longtime sponsors, Dollamer Sports Surfaces, and they make mats for like everything, fitness, yoga, um, martial arts, of course. And um, their mat that we use at San Jose State is the old school tatami style, which you'll see in a lot of dojos, but they also make the flexi roll product, which is like the mat that rolls out and then rolls up and like can get put away in 10 seconds or so. Um, and I see those at a lot of clubs nowadays. But I'm definitely like I always go for the old school tatami if I can. <laughs> yeah, but d- did you? I mean, you mentioned that you know you don't want to. You're out there for a few minutes. You traveled so far, and you might slip. <laughs> like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> that's um, a really good point. So when I say slip, so this is this is a really important caveat. The mats they use in Europe, which is most of the international tour, are not the same ones they use in the U.S. Like they oh. don't use Dolomer, I don't think, and they typically use new mats every tournament. Now, have you ever stepped on new mats? I don't. Like, they're I, slippery. Okay. They're, they're slippery. They're not worn in. There's no sweat. There's no humidity. There's no grip. So, like, when I say you slip in tournament, it's because you're work, You're at a tournament that has brand new mats out there. <laughs> okay. Man, what a, what a way to to spend a a it's lot like of money ongoing, and then and then yeah. and then possibly slip and and all your time and. and it's an for, ongoing joke because, like, we'll you can warm up on the the actual event mats at the tournament, like everyone will be out there warming up and then they'll start the tournament. Right. I'm sure they do that BJJ too. Um, and it will all be, you'll see everyone step on the mat and like swipe their feet across and look at each other and be like, Oh, these are slippery. Like, you know, <laughs> let each other know. <laughs> like, hey, Find a nice this today. <laughs> yep. Oh man. Okay. That's interesting. I just never knew what it would, if there's a big difference and it sounds like, I mean, it's, it's not realistic to be training on new mats all the time. That doesn't happen. <laughs> like, Not uh, at all, yeah. <laughs> so you just deal with that the best you can, I guess. And and uh, that, that, that's interesting. Any any final thoughts or words you want to leave with the audience before I let you go? Um, I mean, no, nothing specific. I would say that if um, anyone listening is interested in having me come to your club to teach a judo seminar, and that's not just limited to judo people, um, you can visit my website, martinmalloy.com and, uh, contact me through there. I am actually going to be going public with open dates I have in 2020, which fill up really, really fast. So, um, definitely jump on that right away. But other than that, uh, Byron, thanks for the great questions. Yeah, cool. I appreciate you on here and you're looking that 2020 dates will be, uh, you're planning on seeing in the U S for those. Um, actually I have my first international seminar in Calgary next year, which I'm super excited about. Um, so yeah, it's kind of whoever, whoever wants to learn some Marty Malloy skills, I'll, I'll go to them. Cool. That's awesome. <laughs> and I wish you the best of luck with that. And, uh, yeah, I thank you. Yeah. Mention it actually. I've done some, um, I've, I'm guessing you have a lot of listeners who do BJJ. So I also do takedown seminars for BJJ. So don't feel discriminated again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. And it's, I'm guessing you're altering them a little bit differently to, uh, to fit the BJJ game. Yeah. Well, I, you know, other than the takedown aspect or sorry, the transition aspect into groundwork, but the other big part of my game was footwork. We say Ashiwaza and judo, which is like tripping people up, tripping them, getting to the mat. So my previous BJJ seminars, I found that that's the thing that the attendees think I could be helpful for. So I kind of focus on that, but, um, I'm happy to throw, show them big throws too. <laughs> well, like a like a foot sweep or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do a whole a bunch of foot sweeps. My whole arsenal. Cool, and I, I the foot sweeps are amazing. <laughs> like, amazing. never have I felt like more, more of an idiot than than just getting. I can't. I literally can't stand up in front of this person because I keep falling down. <laughs> like, I love it's it. It's amazing. <laughs> so that would be kind of fun to learn. Totally, and you know, I. Uh, uh, judo is no it's a throwing sport right we talk about throws mostly but my big thing was was hooking people with the feet like dropping them to the mat and if i didn't score i was on them so fast r- turning them over pinning arm barring etc um 
like that was my way of like getting getting the match over as fast as possible. So it, it's a good transfer. Yeah, and definitely with those those are transitional attacks, I think in jiu-jitsu a lot of times we uh, get to we want to solidify the position and hold them there for a little while longer. And and uh, judo is so fast. It's like as soon as you have an opportunity to to do an arm bar or something like you're you're all over that. <laughs> you have to be, and you know the referees are. They, they sometimes they give you more time to work on the mat and sometimes they don't and you just kind of got to know which referees have the patience for it or not but my thing is like always go fast otherwise you don't have to worry about that <laughs> that's a good way to, to, to do that <laughs> but uh yeah thank you and i'll put links to everything in the in the show notes and and uh in your website and all that stuff as well so thank you so much marty for hopping on here with me yeah it was a pleasure it was great to meet you byron i want to thank marty malloy for hopping on the interview with me and uh and sharing some of her story and some of, some of her training ideas. And yeah, she is uh, teaching seminars now and not just to jujitsu uh, academies and clubs. Uh, she's more than happy to come to a jujitsu place and, and do, you know, kind of a split between jujitsu and, and judo. And she's going to show you some really cool stuff on the mat from a different angle. And I've always enjoyed learning from people who kind of come at it a different angle. Maybe it's a, a you know, high level wrestler or judo player teaching a jiu-jitsu seminar they do things a little differently and they have some details to things that uh, that we just don't uh aren't aware of sometimes so that's really a cool thing that she's doing get a hold of her i'll put some links in the show notes for contact information if you want her to come teach a seminar at your place if you think this is an interview that a friend would like to hear do share that with them and uh, let them know that marty malloy is uh is bringing bringing some good information uh, on the podcast here and, and sharing the podcast with friends is the best way that we have been able to have this podcast grow. It's just kind of word of the mouth and uh, amongst training partners. So do that. We appreciate it a ton. It really means a lot to us. And you guys uh, share this with your buddies. Absolutely. Joe, what do we have for the article of the week? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, safety tips for dodgeball. And I know that's not exactly what we do recreationally, but um, it's kind of amazing how many of these safety tips relate directly to jiu-jitsu. Um, I really like the first one. It says, warm up your muscles and properly stretch before playing. And uh, I, I'm guilty of not always doing that. Like open mats, I'll go in all the time and like two minutes of moving around and then I'm ready to roll. And I probably should do a better job of, of stretching. Uh, and, the, and they really uh, stress here um, that uh, stretching is not necessarily warming up. Yeah, it's, it's stretching, but warming up is good too. So you stretch, you warm up, uh, maybe do some jumping jacks, uh, some jujitsu exercises, and then go. So uh, that's a good tip. Yeah, try to get and, a sweat. Joe, you know, yeah, Joe, yep. you and I both being a b- little bit older, we used to, I could get away with that before. I'd go out of the basketball court, not even warm up, and uh, go full blast. Uh, I'd get to the gym and uh, train some jiu-jitsu and go full blast. But uh, today, that doesn't work. Uh, you know, warming up is, is the key. And, you know, I know Byron keeps a pain journal or injury journal, I guess you call it. And uh, every time he gets hurt, you know, he kind of looks for common denominators to find out what is going on. And, and um uh, we we have to talk about that pain journal or injury journal sometime there, Byron, too. I know we have before, but I think it's a great uh, tool. But, you know, he'll see common denominators of getting injured. And I don't necessarily write this stuff down, but, man, every time I, I pull something or whatever, it has always worked to always not warming up properly. I don't put enough time into it. And one of my buddies here is a personal trainer. Uh, shout out to Miles Brown at Ford Fitness. Um but Miles was really helping me with it because I was stretching. And, uh, you know, that's really what I was all, all I was doing was stretching. Like Byron said, you need to get a little sweat going. And, you know, Miles, you know, started having me doing, you know, squats and, uh, you know, lunges across the mat and Frankenstein walks and, you know, stuff like that. You know, uh, stretching your, you know, you're, you're moving your muscles through full range of motion, but you're also taxing them. And um, since I started doing that, it, it did make a big difference for me. So, uh, uh, you know, thanks, Miles, for helping me out there. It's great having, uh, like, Miles around and as a resource to help us uh, kind of tune ourselves up there. Um, another one that, uh, that they do in this dodgeball sport that they have <laughs> is that they warm up specific parts of their body 
you know, to, to get ready, like particularly their throwing arms. So obviously I can jujitsu. We do have our sides that we play things on. I think Gary's usually trying to come on my right arm versus, you know, my left arm. But, uh, in dodgeball, you throw with the same arm every time. And so it's an intense movement, repetitive, fairly repetitive. If you're like me, you get out in the first round and you're not going to be throwing that many balls at people. But if you're throwing a ball like Gary or Joe, you might be in there for a little while before you get hit in the head. Uh... <laughs> well, the thing is, though, like Joe and I were talking, Byron doesn't throw a lot of balls. He normally catches balls. <laughs> Hey, you got you got right on the chin. <laughs> <laughs> but man, okay, um, just warm up. You know, whatever part needs to be warmed Byron up. Byron got a up. Byron got a tattoo of a catcher's mitt on his chin. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Uh, there, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's an edit for you. Check yeah. out my my. Uh, well, you know, but besides that, Joe. Byron really does have a kind chin. <laughs> okay. I won't, I won't say the rest of it. Uh, going down the list on this dodgeball uh, tips for being safe. If your throwing arm starts to hurt while playing, please stop throwing. Makes sense. If if something's starting to hurt, you have to listen to those pain signals and uh, and, and either do something differently. And I could think of this a lot when... When someone's like, hey, my my legs bothered me a little bit or my knee is, is kind of sore, the next question usually is, well, does it hurt less to play on, you know, bottom or top? Do you want to play in your guard or do you want to work to pass my guard or, or whatever? And and just from that spot right there, it lets you train so much safer um, if, if your teammates are willing to work with you a little bit. You know, Byron, I like the next one. Uh, technique is the key to throwing. And, uh you know, having good technique is going to protect your arm. It's going to allow you to throw harder, just like in jiu-jitsu. Uh, good technique is going to go a long way and keep you uh, from being injured. Um, not only does it help you throw harder and more accurate, but it keep you safe. And, you know, we can go back to uh, uh, Marty that we just interviewed there, um, you know, talking about throwing harder. You know, I guarantee you, well, I, just, I know for a fact her technique is incredible, and uh, she throws very hard and throws us on her head. So, um um, technique is a key. Yeah, so so technique is the key for effectiveness, like you were saying, Gary. But I'll also add that uh, when we do takedown drills at the gym, especially if they're wrestling, you know, single leg, double legs, man, my back's always really sore afterwards. And part of that's because I'm old, and part of it's because I haven't developed a really great wrestling technique. And, you know, you go in and do, you do uh, single and double legs where your legs aren't you know, you haven't changed levels like you should. Yep. You've just bent over at the waist. That'll kill you. You know, so so proper technique uh, will get you through a class without jacking your back up or whatever else you might be doing. Great point, Joe. Um, I, I like uh, be aware of other people on the court when running, jumping, and dodging. Um, it makes me think back to, and I think it was season one of The Ultimate Fighter when we had Nate Quarry on there. Um, I remember Nate Quarry was on one side of the mat and, and I think he was standing up and a couple other people were rolling on the other side of the mat and they rolled right into his ankle and, uh, he was out of the ultimate fighter. Um, you know, injuries, uh, you know, are going to happen. Know where other people are at, you know, grow eyes in the back of your head, literally, um, you know, always know what's going on around you. And like, if you, like Byron mentioned earlier, if you have a sore arm, stop throwing, you know, take yourself out and put somebody else in and, uh, while you're out there on the sidelines, don't sit there and turn around and talk to people in the stands who are watching you play dodgeball. Uh, keep an eye out on what's going on. Cheer your teammates on. But it'll also allow you to be safe if you know what's going on. No, uh, nobody's going to come over and, you know, dive in for, a, you know, to catch a ball, going to run into you. You're not going to get hit in the face with balls. Stuff like that's not going to happen. Yeah. I, I like the next point. And even the point after that's probably more applicable for buyer. And it says knee pads are recommended. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let him catch that one in a minute. <laughs> um, but no, I do like the next one. It says never, uh, or I guess this is the next one. Never throw at your opponent's head. And, and that, this is a safety tip for dodgeball, but I, I have things in jujitsu that I don't do for the safety of my teammates. I don't play a lot of foot locking, but you know, I, I like toe holds a little bit. If I get a toe hold and my opponent tries to explode out of it, I just let go. I will not hold a, 
a foot lock through any kind of a scramble. Um, if you're a fighter and you're training for a fight, it, yeah, you got to do that. But I won't hold a foothold. I won't hold a foot lock through a scramble. I never push my opponent straight backwards if he's on his knees. Thank um, you. Yes, I, I, I don't. I hate uh, that. Yeah, I don't do net. I'll, I'll let go of a choke if I feel like it's more of a net crank than a choke. And so I, I kind of like this. It says never throw at your opponent's head. And that's for dodgeball. But I think in jujitsu, when you're training, you should just know what some of the more dangerous crap is and just avoid it for the protection of your teammates. Joe, you were talking about, you know, never push somebody backwards. Uh, somebody went to take my back and try to choke me and pulled me back over. Oh man, that sucks. Yeah. And you know, I've gotten that position before and I start going back and I see that I'm pulling somebody over and I just let go. And, uh, you know, somebody started pulling me back and I was like, Oh man, my knees are going to explode. You know, like it all moved in slow motion. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm done. And I, I got out of it and I felt a pop in one side of my knee and I look over at my other side of my knee or my other leg and my toes totally sideways. I got dislocated. <laughs> <laughs> and I was That's like, awesome. so I jack up one knee and my toe on the other side is pointing straight sideways. And I was like, yep. And, and I assume most people listening uh, have already uh, dealt with this. They, they understand what we're talking about. But if you don't, when a person's on their knees and the top of their feet are on the floor, if you pull them straight back over their feet, you're going to jack their ankles up, dislocate their toe, blow their knees out. I mean, there's just a ton of crap. Especially uh, when you're 52 years old like Joe and I. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't take somebody's back and pull them in into back control. Yeah, but you just it. have to do it at an angle. If you pull off at 20, 30 degrees to either side, if you kind of fall I'm to good. your side pulling them back, then you avoid most of those injuries. Yeah. So Gary's always complaining if I take his back. That's, uh, <laughs> oh, that's shoot, how it goes. After hearing about you. With all this stuff, I, I don't blame myself for being a little scared. <laughs> they, they say that in, the last thing in the article is that uh, athletic tape is, is a dodgeballer's best friend. And I know a lot of uh, jiu-jitsu athletes, and, as well as judo, you know, do put quite a bit of tape on their fingers. Um, some, it helps your injuries heal. And I know some people do it just to help prevent injuries. You know, if you're going to play a gi intensive game that involves them trying to rip, you know, the, their, their gi out of your hands, um, your fingers are going to get popped and snapped from time to time just in that, I, uh, in that fight. So, uh, some of them will do that. I think spider guard is one that comes to mind, um, as a type of guard. You know, they do like the, the Black Widow and they try to snap your fingers and break that grip. That's going to hurt a little bit. I like it, Byron. So, you brought the Black Widow in. Yeah, you you got <laughs> you just got to prepare. So I don't take my fingers, but I also don't put my fingers in a spot where they're going to get that, you know, kind of force against them. So I don't need the tape. And that's just been a kind yeah. of an overall strategy for me is just uh, I'd rather have – good hands or decent hands when I'm an old man, even older, than have torn up hands that I can't pick hold up a pencil or I don't know I don't know what we'll be doing in the future. Hey, that that digital pen, you know, that stylus. Uh you wanna so, you want just take care of your body. And if if a little bit of tape helps you do that, that's an option. But for me it's been not that style of game. Just don't play that style that hurts you. Hey, do any of you guys have played dodgeball or like I know they have leagues and stuff like that here in the last five, ten years? I've, I've played. I haven't played dodgeball since probably I was in third grade, Gary. You're like me. What about you, Byron? I've, I've, I used to love it in junior high. Uh, I've played once as an adult. The radio station here in town had a dodgeball. Yeah, it has You sign tournament. up and you get a tournament. t-shirt for 20 bucks and you, you, you and five of your buddies go out there and get single eliminated in the first round. (laughs) Yeah. Well, here's my question, uh, because they're talking about the athletic finger tape, but they put jam fingers as common in dodgeball, especially among those that are catchers. So do you have people that just catch the ball and people that just throw the ball on your team? No, I don't believe so, Gary, but I I believe that uh, you're likely to fit into one camp. <laughs> okay, I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you got to be able to do everything. You're likely Gary. to fit. In one- yeah, you got to be a pitcher and a catcher. Well, sure. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I see. I see. This comment was directed at Byron, and I. <laughs> no, actually, I was being told. You know, I wasn't putting it down, going down that path. But I didn't know if you just had some guys who don't throw the ball who just catch him. And no, people- I think as a means of defense, you have two options: either to get out of the way or to catch the ball. Okay. And, and if you choose to kind of specialize in catching the ball, then yeah, you're likely to get jacked up fingers. And Byron, if you played in the junior high, you might remember. But I think it used to be like if you could catch a ball, you could get somebody back into the game that That's had been true. eliminated. And yeah, you eliminate one point. of their teammates. Yeah, 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 right. So it's a you could really swing the the game. Yeah. See you now know, there's there's probably a jujitsu lesson there. Yeah. Byron, if you have another uh dodgeball article for next week, we should do a quote by Patches O'Hallahan. Oh yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, oh, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll work with that. And see I was like, I who is Patches O'Hallahan? I even know the quote you're gonna th- you're gonna say, Gary. Okay, I even know the. Well, quote. there could be other quote. For- There's just one. Okay, if you could dodge, I don't know. Yeah. I think Patches has other quotes. I'm sure he does. You gotta watch the movie though. He had more than one line. Yeah, probably a whole movie full of them. Yep. So check out the so, article. It's uh on. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's New Orleans dodgeball.com and if you go to the website if you go to the website and you're interested in what's going on at dodgeball in the new orleans area you can uh let's see where did i click you can click on league standings to see how the teams are doing that's in this league and you'll see now that the chiwis are are in first place (laughs) stranger flings is in second shifty shafts is in third place uh foamland security is in Fourth place and coming up last is Dodge My Balls. Dodge My Balls <laughs> so. has 13 wins and 17 losses. That's pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Gary, go, Gary, click on the game strategy uh, thing, and in the very first thing under strategy is ball control. Uh, really good information there as well that you're going to want <laughs> to to learn about. Anyways, guys, I, I, I do want to take this time to tell you about a new project that we <laughs> have started, uh, that I started, that I drug you guys in on, or what? How, how would you classify this? Uh, it's the, it's a, it's a group. It's on Facebook. It's called BJJ by the Month, and I'll I'll run this by you guys. I talked with you a little bit about it before. I'll explain it now with everybody else listening, and uh, and see if this makes sense. So a lot of people train almost randomly. They come in, their coach teaches Kimuras from guard today. And tomorrow it's going to be takedowns. And then the next day it's mountain escapes. And the next, it's just all over the place, which is how a lot of people learn jujitsu. It's just not really that focused. And, And one of my big steps that I've made around late blue belt level, I think, is when I decided to find a thing and work on that thing for about a month. And sometimes I'd have a hard time figuring out what to do, but whenever I locked in on something for a month, I would go study about it. I would watch VHS tapes. I would, uh, you know, read magazine articles. Wait, 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 Byron, you did, you watched what? We had some tapes that I could borrow from the coach. Yeah, uh, Craig VHS? Kukux. Craig Kukux. Uh, Man, remember those? Who was that? A, the, yeah. the, uh, did you just do A to Z or I something had, like I that? S- I think I still have that somewhere. Oh, that's awesome. Nice. So, <laughs> I, we would, so if I picked a thing for a month, you know, whether it be uh, like yeah, it was triangle chokes or uh, you know, guard attacks in general or takedowns, whatever, I would do off the mat learning, like schoolwork on it and try to figure some stuff out and then come in earlier, maybe stay a little late or, you know, work with a buddy uh, at home or, you know, get my brother to, to do something with me and just get a little bit extra stuff in and be focused about this certain 
aspect of jujitsu. And then when I roll, I'm also going to be incorporating that specifically into my training. So if you're training and this month is takedowns, you're going to hopefully get a lot of rounds where you start standing up. You have a school that has enough mat space that people can stand up. Or maybe you would, uh, at the end of training, if you didn't get to do many takedowns, you might pick somebody with um, you know, that, that's willing to stand up with you and, and go an extra round and, and say, hey, let's work a couple takedowns. Let's get three or four or so um, and, and do that. So focus training for a month. And the, the plan is at the beginning of the month and maybe towards the end of the, the month, kind of give you a little heads up, I'll post uh, what we're going to be training and, and then some videos that I really like about that topic. And of course, you do your own uh, research as well and, and findings and uh, and we go out there and we do our best for that month. And I'm going to be doing the same thing. Uh, it's January. <laughs> Hope to do it the whole year. See how we do. Um, not sure. I think the uh, we're going to start off with just guard attacks or, or guard submissions. And uh, I think that's a good one to start with because anybody can get to that position. If we started with mount attacks. And, and a lot of us have trouble just getting to mount, and that's going to be a tough place to actually train. You're going to have to like request specially of your opponents or your training partner, hey, can I start and mount this round and see how that goes? Um, which, which when we do that sort of thing, we'll talk about that and, and talk about being a team player. But uh, the first month, which has already started, is going to be uh, guard submissions or, or guard attacks. Uh, and I think that's better than just doing just any attack versus like the sweep. Because once you sweep, you're now fighting in the top position and we want to be developing our guard guard game as far as adding submissions. I think there's a lot of good uh, attacks and submissions that come off of sweeps. Like they have to fin your sweep and then you can set up your triangle or they leave their deck open for a guillotine. There's a lot of cool stuff. But this week, join me, my friends, working on developing a more submission-oriented guard. And uh, check out bjjbrick.com. I'll have the post with all the videos. Go to the Facebook page. Uh, type in BJJ by the month. And uh, the stuff will be there as well. And then, of course, if you have a favorite video or a question about that, uh, you know, this topic of this month, uh, ask it. And uh, hopefully the group will provide some support. And we'll continue through the year having our guided training together. What do you guys think? Awesome idea, Byron. I can't wait to start it. I actually joined today. Well, that's odd. I invited oh, you shit. yesterday. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Well, I joined today. Well, good. Some I'm, of us are a little more busy than others. That's true. And I don't know how I find time to start this thing. So check it out. It's it's a Facebook group, and uh, there's information on, on the website, bjbrick.com, that will be supporting it. But... Uh, yeah, once if you guys are interested in that, um, you know, get yourself in a, in a couple of teammates and and uh, let's let's train together, even though we're separated by a few miles, more than a few miles at times, yes. even continents hey, and oceans. You were just talking about groups and supports. Let's give a shout out to our Patreon supporters, Byron. Who do we got this week? Robert and Rob <laughs> uh, hitting the R's this week. And might as well throw in Rolo. That's all the, the R's I see on this page anyway uh, for their support. Uh, what, what Robert, Rob, and Rolo have done is they've listened to the podcast. They thought, they would, hey, I'd like to support these guys and help them continue on what they're doing. Uh, go to the link in the show notes, Patreon, and you can pledge a dollar. Some people are pledging $3 per episode. And at the end of the month, uh, that pledge is automatically uh, collected. And for our a token of our appreciation, I will mail you at a five inch BJJ brick gi patch. We have a brand new one, and I've got a couple of the old ones left, I think. Uh, so you can get two patches for that, and I send you out a sticker. And then you can also join our private Facebook group for BJJ Brick, where we're doing stuff behind the scenes and talking about things and, uh, you know, giving dodgeball tips as well. So check that out. Uh, I usually give our new members a shout out, but no new members this week. But we're looking for you, my friend. You could be the new ne- member. Of next week. <laughs> so, I like it. Yeah, I should. That's probably a little better than I usually do. Anyway, uh, it really yeah, means a you, lot to us. Every time we get a new supporter, I'm, I'm thrilled. I always tell my wife, hey, we've got a new Patreon supporter. I tell my wife this. and So it does, it, you guys make my day every time somebody signs up on Patreon. So, uh, you know, really cool. Joe, any thoughts about the uh, BTJ by the month? 
I'm looking forward to it. And I think, uh, I think that's a really common sense way to start, uh, guard position and being aggressive and attacking from your guard. So I'm looking forward to it. Yep. Well, cool. I appreciate that, Joe. And, and we're all on there. And so, uh, we, we like to see your comments and, and, uh, any, anything you have, you know, do you have a favorite guard attacks video? Maybe your coach made a, a, a video showing how to do a, a real clean arm bar from there, whatever. Feel free to post stuff on there. We all like to see that. And, as we are working on this specific aspect of our game and getting better at jujitsu together. That's the plan. So check it out. Uh, BJJ by the month guys next week, we have Avery Clements on the show. You'll notice, uh, or you'll recognize her name from, uh, jujitsu times.com. Yes. She writes a ton of articles. Um, she writes a ton. She's good. And so, uh, I, I've had this experience. Somebody will comment about a podcast we did three years ago. Mike, okay, <laughs> yeah, I you know it's hard to remember what happened three years ago. So I told Avery, I'm just going to bring up some fairly recent articles, and we're going to talk about those, and then we'll talk about you know some other stuff, jujitsu related, and and that sort of thing. So uh, we kind of cover some of our more recent articles, which I think are very interesting and relevant to the current day uh, jujitsu world. So anyway, you guys are going to love it. Until then, stay sweaty, my friends, and go sign up. Uh, or join the private group BJJ by the month. And also join the private group BJJ by the month. Yeah, and train <laughs> hard, train smart, and uh, train according to Byron's monthly plan on BJJ by the month. And, so make uh, sure you join BJJ by the month. Yeah, that's at BJJ by the month. So it's on Facebook. Uh, join up and, and get better at jujitsu. And make sure, like Joe said, when you type it in, you type in BJJ by the month. Don't forget a J because you may go to another site. There you go. Get, you already had a little bit of a nightmare that you were going to say, uh, sign up for my BJJ by the week. <laughs> and it would uh. be like, ah, oh, Gary upstaged me again. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. I will tell you guys my story with smoke signals. <laughs> so I was a senior in high school. You want to say it for next week? And me and my... And... No. Okay. We're okay. here. <laughs> Make a oh, life lesson, yeah. Gary. It's not a story. It, there ain't no life lesson out of this besides stay out of jail. But um, I uh, bought a smoke... Or we... Uh, bought some really big uh, uh, smoke bombs, uh, you know, around 4th of July time. They looked like Roman candles. They were that big. So um, we uh, decided we were going to set it off in the lunchroom. And uh, so what we did is we took a cigarette, uh, cut off the filter, hollowed it out, and put it over the the wick. And then we got some masking tape. And underneath the table, we put the masking tape, and we put that big old mortar smoke in there. uh, And we lit the cigarette. And we stay at the table for like four or five seconds and we decide to leave, you know, just casually. Some other people go sit there and about five minutes later, that thing just started pouring smoke out. We had never tested one before, so we had no clue how much smoke was coming out. See? Next thing you know, the fire department's there, the alarm's going off. And all I kept thinking was like, I am going to get kicked out of school. The moral of the story is they never caught me and I got away scot-free. So, Gary, I still have one more uh, Uh smoke distress signal and a dozen parachute flares. So if you want to come over, (laughs) we'll have a good old time, Joe. (laughs) 